and that's all I'll say about that. Let's get on with the evening, shall we? Um, Mayuk Sin is a food writer based in New York. He's won both James Beard and IACP awards for his writing, and his work has been anthologized in the Best American Food Writing in 2019. He's currently working on his first book on the immigrant women who have shaped food culture in America, which if you've even peeked at Monique's book, you know this is a perfect pairing. And uh, Monique Chong is the author of The Book of Salt, Bitter in the Mouth, and her work has been published in 15 countries. Her awards and honors include the Penn Robert Bingham Fellowship, the New York Public Library Lions Award, the Asian American Literary Award, and the American Academy of Arts and Letters Rosenthal Family Foundation Award. Monique's gifts are in full display in her latest novel, The Sweetest Fruits. And I know you are as excited as I am to celebrate her and this beautiful novel tonight. So please welcome Mayuk and Monique to the stage. Hey everybody, how's it going? Hello. How are you, Monique? I'm good. Yeah. How are you? I'm okay. You know, good. Um, I hear you have a new book out. Um, <laughs> congratulations, if that's Thanks. the case. No, yeah. but in it's all good. seriousness, um, <laughs> it, congratulations on writing another completely stunning book. You know, I, I truly couldn't put it down. That sounds like cliche, but I mean it. Um, I wanted to know, first off, so this book took you eight years to write. Can you take me back to the moment when you first had the idea for this book? Um, yes, I can. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please do in that case. OK. Well, uh, I came across um, a very small biographical um, entry on Lafcadio Hearn in a um, Southern Encyclopedia. Uh, and it was specifically about foodways of the South. And um, he, you know, I know you know this, that he is um, known within the food world still as the author of the very first Creole cookbook in the United States. And uh, so, okay, that made sense to me. That's why he's in this book. And then um, it, there was just a couple of more lines that totally didn't make sense to me which is that, um, you know, he, towards the, the end of his life, he moved to Japan. He um, became known as a Western expert on folklore and fairy tales and ghost stories. Um, and I just could not really understand how he got from point A to point B, right? <laughs> and that usually uh, signals that a novel is going to happen. <laughs> so how much historical record did you have to work from? Well, Hearn uh, left us with many, many volumes um, of his uh, correspondence, as well as you know, works inclu including uh, literary translations, novellas, um, uh, travel, essay writing, that sort of thing. Um, so there's a lot, right? But um, because I prefer <laughs> not to write from the center, you know, um, and wanted to focus on some of the women in his life, the material um, that was available about them was uh, much less. And that um, that uh, became, I suppose, part of that eight-year hunt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it might be helpful for the audience to talk about who some of those women were. OK. Um, well, <laughs> uh, it, the novel's told in the first-person voice of um, three women. Rosa, his, um, his mother, um, she's now considered to be uh, Greek, but um, she's from one of the Ionian islands, um, which at that time was not part of Greece yet. Um, and his second wife, or his first wife, who is uh, named Alethea Foley. And Alethea 
um, was a, uh, she was born into slavery in the state of Connecticut. Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Kentucky. Um, I'll explain to you why Connecticut is on my mind, because in the front row here are my in-laws. <laughs> and they're from Connecticut, okay? <laughs> Lafcario met Alethea in Ohio um, a couple of years after the, the Civil War. And, um, and then the third voice is his second wife. And his second wife was named uh, Koizumi uh, Setsu. And uh, Hearn met her in Matsue, Japan, the first place where he lived uh, in Japan. And she uh, became his wife and the mother of his four children, yeah? And also, I was very pleased to find during this, this whole sort of process that she was also really um, one of his main literary uh, collaborators, you know, in the sense that she was the person who told him a lot of the ghost stories and the, and the folklore tales that he then rewrote you know, into English and made his name. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's a fourth woman in this book. Um, yes, yes. Thank she's you. a sort of interstitial voice kind of ferrying us in between the chapters. Can you talk a bit about her? Yes, wow. <laughs> that's I read the book. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's exactly what she is. Um, her name is Elizabeth Beeslin, and Elizabeth um, uh, was Hearn's first biographer. And she was a, a good friend of Hearn during, um, there's a 10 year age difference between them, but um, she was also a journalist. And she um, basically excerpts from her biography of Hearn serves as the, um, the framework, right? It's, essentially, it serves as the official history of Hearn, um, the archive, if you will. I can, yeah. She's got it. <laughs> um, but Elizabeth Baislin is an incredibly um, interesting woman in her own right. Uh, she was basically Nellie Bly's um, competitor when Nellie did the, um, the round the world in 80 days challenge. Um, and Nellie won. <laughs> So uh, did you ever have any desire to kind of flesh her out a bit more as a character in the same way that you did these three other women? No. Why not? <laughs> well, because she, she uh, was one of the rare exceptions, right, in terms of women who um, were at that time part of the, the elite. You know, she was not only a journalist, um, in uh, New Orleans, and then she became a journalist in New York City. She was an editor at, at that time, Cosmopolitan, uh, which is not the same Cosmo <laughs> <laughs> that we know. <laughs> but <laughs> she, you know, she was able to uh, have her own voice and to have it documented and published. And she had her say about her. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I was more interested in the women who didn't have that, um, that uh, privilege. Right, totally. So as a journalist, what really interests me about your whole project, not with just this book, but with all your other books, is that you, know, you see a character like him, you know, and you're like, OK, who is this man who kind of ping-ponged around the globe? You know? Born in Greece, went to Ireland, Cincinnati, Japan. How do I connect the dots, you know? Yeah. And the way that you kind of answer all these questions you have is through writing historical fiction as opposed to journalism. And I want to ask you, as a journalist who has not dabbled at all in fiction whatsoever, because I'm so scared of it, what is it about historical fiction that allows you to answer those questions in a way yeah. that maybe your traditional journalism cannot? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, well. You know, the way that I think of historical fiction, or my approach to historical fiction, is that 
I get to write between the facts, right? Mm -hmm. So I would never change a fact, um, a, a date of birth, a place of birth, that sort of thing, you know, a, a place where Hearn lived or didn't live. That's, um, but um, there is, especially when you want to write the, the narratives of, um, of basically the people at the margins, you know, then <laughs> and still now, right? Um, often they don't appear in official history. They don't appear in the documents, you know, that are in our archives, right? Um, either they did not have access to an education or they did but could not get access to, to actually, you know, this, this world of publishing or, you know, or even simply did they keep a journal? You know, all the things that a historian, a journalist, you know, could pull from, right? Those things are more often than not missing. When you're talking about the stories of women or women of color in yeah. particular, yeah. you know, with rare exceptions, right? Totally. There are. Absolutely. So I am curious, um, this book is so much about who gets to tell whose stories throughout history. Who is telling his story throughout history primarily? You named one person who's Elizabeth, but who else was there? You mean within this narrative? Oh no, just generally, ah. you know, before you began writing this book. You know. Oh, I see. Who was telling Hearn's story? Exactly. Yes. Ah, yes. Well, Hearn himself, you know, <laughs> he he was. I I think that one of the interesting things as I was going through some of his biographies, and there were actually quite a few biographies <laughs> um, out there about Hearn. There's a lot of um, second guessing you know, of Beeslin, the first biographer. Mm -hmm. Because Beeslin, I really think, was such a dear friend of Hearn and also had such a, a, a particular agenda, which was to write a book that would sell and, and help to keep his family in Tokyo in, you know, in the house and in the, in the, in the means that they had, mm -hmm. you know, to preserve their their livelihood, mm -hmm. that and two, to preserve his legacy, you know, as a great man of letters. Sure. So Beeslin was not the most accurate biographer, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what, what happened, though, is that initially a lot of the subsequent biographers would, um, would simply repeat what Beeslin had said, and one one incredibly, uh, when you hear it, you, I mean, come on, you can sense that it's apocryphal, which is the story that, that um, when uh, Lafcadio Hearn's uh, father-to-be, right, meets his mother um, on one of the Ionian islands, that what happened was that her brothers stabbed this, you know, this Irishman um, and, and left him for dead. And that, um, and that she, uh, Rosa the Young, um, you know, besotted uh, lover, nursed him back to health. Well, that's just bull. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, subsequent biographers started to really question that. And if you think about it, where is Elizabeth getting this story, right? right. From Hearn himself. Totally. And Hearn's a great storyteller. That's a great story. Mm -hmm. But I, I really, you have to question. <laughs> right, totally. Right? Absolutely. So you did a lot of traveling for this book. Mm. And you went to Greece at one point, and something very uh, interesting happened there. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that trip? And who you met specifically, or who you spoke to? <laughs> You talk about this in the acknowledgments. Really? You do. <laughs> you had some sort of epiphany where some a very crucial character in this book spoke to you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Are you, are you talking about Lafcadio himself? Yeah, yeah, the guy who this book's about. I know, this is going to make me sound daft. <laughs> but it's true. Um, I, 
my husband and I went to the island where uh, Hearn was born. It's called Lafcada, Lafcadio. See the connection? <laughs> okay. So, but um, we uh, we well we we many things happen, but. Um, we essentially tried to go up a very high mountain in a very weak car. Um, <laughs> and when we finally got to our destination, which was this tiny little restaurant that was owned by um, a husband and wife, um, and finally sort of was enjoying, you know, this, this incredible view before us and this incredible, beautiful meal. It really did feel like Lafcadio said, you know, here, I bless you. You know, it, it really did feel as if he did give me um, a, a kiss, you know, up there and said, oh, but it's gonna take seven more years. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to know a bit more about those seven years, you know, in terms of your process, like when you were writing, did you kind of, you know, take one woman out of time, basically, and, you know, spend a lot of time writing her story, you know, like closing that chapter up, moving on to the next one, or did you toggle between the voices? Mm -hmm. What was more help, most helpful for you and why? Right. Um, when, in terms of the research, um, Gosh, I'm trying to think, did I take it one at a time? Yeah, I, the, the initial bout of research was, was really just trying to consume as much Hearn as I can, you know, and his biographies as well as, as his uh, own writing. But um, it, uh, in terms of the writing, I really did focus on one woman at a time because the voices are so different um, and they, they had such, at least, you know, for me, there were very specific reasons why these women were opening up to us uh, and telling us their stories. And um, I had to figure that out first. Mm -hmm. You know, I needed to know why, why would Rosa tell someone her story, you know. Um, and uh, my answer to that is that Rosa is on a ship leaving Dublin, heading back to the Ionian Islands. And uh, in Dublin is her four-year-old son. And she's left him. And that is true, right? And the question is why, right? And why would this woman then want to to sort of preserve this moment, you know, and what would she say? And um, yeah, and and I went through that process with the other two women as well, mm -hmm. um, because I think that especially when you're writing in the first person voice, you really are, you know, your character is addressing the reader, and as in life. We don't just open up our mouths and you know for no reason, right? We have, we always have an agenda. We have a purpose for telling someone our story. So that becomes as much of the story as 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 you know as their interactions with her and and so on. Mm -hmm, totally. So one thing that you do so skillfully and gracefully in this book is you inhabit these women's inner lives in a way that feels so full and rich mm -hmm. you know um, as selfishly as a writer is kind of undertaking a similar project i was wondering what what kind of tips would you have for you know a writer who is writing of an experience outside themselves in the way that you did right um well you set aside uh, your assumptions and your presumptions um, about your character. And what I mean specifically about that is that two of my characters, Rosa and Althea, um, did not have access to the written word, right? Which is another way of saying they're illiterate. But I prefer saying that they did not have access because that 
really, to me, emphasizes the denial of their right to learn and to be educated. Uh, to say someone is illiterate just simply is a, you know, that's what happens because of the denial, right? Yes. So with them in particular, I had to figure out what is their relationship to narrative, right, to storytelling. Um, and if I came into that project with any sort of, you know, idea that, oh, it's, it's going to be a lesser or a diminished relationship, I would have, I think the project would have been a disaster, mm -hmm. you know. Totally. So I, 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 I suppose that's my, my, I would say that that's my advice, is to let go of what you know about language, what you know about narrative, and see language and narrative through your character's eyes. Absolutely. So you talked about these first two women, Rosa and Althea. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about uh, the third woman, Setsuko, yeah. and you know she obviously had a lot of writing on her husband, yet her voice was kind of mediated and compromised in certain ways. Could yeah. you talk a bit about? Yeah, Setsu actually also uh, was credited as the writer of a short uh, sort of memoir of her life with Hearn. And that was published also pretty shortly, or at least the project began very shortly after his passing, and pretty much for the same reason, which was to generate income. You know, here she is in her, um, I think she was around in her mid-30s, maybe a little bit older when he passed, right? So with four children. Um, and so she wrote in, well, she didn't actually write. I mean, she, she was definitely able to read and write in Japanese. But what she did was she actually told her story to someone who wrote it down, to a scribe. Because right. she was actually very ashamed of her, her um, writing. She, she didn't, her education ended at, um, I think, the eighth grade. And so she was never very comfortable looking at it, you know. Um, but so that work was then translated into English. There were two translators. And I read that first translation. Um, and there was something off about it. And I, 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 I think. I think that a lot of us can sometimes sense this, even if the language that the work is being translated from is not a language that you have access to, sometimes it just sounds off, you know? And you're like, you don't trust what's on that page. I don't know, Does, do you ever yes. have that feeling? Totally. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not, I have no Japanese, so it's not like I'm, I'm this was just kind of this feeling that I had and um, so, but I did manage to find another translation that was done in the 80s. Huh. Okay. Um, and it was vastly different. It was done by um, a Japanese scholar. Um, but with, with her, her narrative, with Setsu, the narrative or her voice is mediated by translation, right? It's mediated by translation as well as the agenda which was very similar to Elizabeth, which was, I need to make this man's legacy, you know, I need to make it static, yeah. preserve it, totally. you know, because it's not just about him, it's also to feed my children. And so what I imagine for Setsu in The Sweetest Fruits is, is that what we're hearing because she, she's, she's telling it to another scribe. She's telling it to, maybe it's the same scribe, right? right? But she's telling this narrative that's going to be edited and sort of cleaned up and, you know, a lot of it's suppressed, right? That's what's going to make it to print. But what we are hearing in the novel is, is the, let's, let's just say the unvarnished, right, narrative, something that actually can't exist except within the pages of a fiction. Totally. Yeah. So um, again, like I said earlier, the 
question that's kind of haunting and animating this book is this idea of who gets to tell whose stories. You are not Greek. You're not black like Elephant. What? I, I, I hate to break it to you, Monique. I'm sorry. Um, and you're not Japanese. I was wondering if you ever had any sort of anxiety regarding writing outside of yourself, because I think that's a lot. Of, that's something that kind of haunts a lot of uh, writers, isn't it? That kind of anxiety. It does right. me. So. Yes. Yes, and it is all true. I am not Greek, <laughs> I'm not African American, and I'm not Japanese. Yeah, it's breaking news. Yep. <laughs> um, yes, well, I think, Mayuk, what I would say is that, um, I would say that I felt a tremendous amount of anxiety, as I should, when I decided that I would write in the first person voices of these three women. But I think that um, to put yourself at risk, to challenge yourself, to basically uh, face the fact that you may fail that's part of being, I, I think, a creative laborer, mm -hmm. right? And if you're not doing that, um, I'm not interested in doing it. Right. You know? Do you feel you succeeded? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there's, there's, a, there's a really wonderful scholar um, at Columbia named Sa uh, Saida Hart Sadia Hartman. Hartman. Exactly. And she wrote this incredible essay, uh, Venus in Two Acts. Uh, is that right? Is Benedict here, the person who introduced this to me? Did I get the? OK. Oh, thank you. Yes. So many scholars in this audience. <laughs> um, but she, the, you know, she talks about what happens in this enterprise of, of trying to write when the archive is essentially empty, you know, to write these stories of the subaltern, the other. Um, and she says that you're basically going to fail, you know? And, um, but the tension of wanting to know these narratives so much and, and is the possibility that you are the very real possibility that you're not actually, you know, go, you, you're not going to revive them as if it's a seance, right? <laughs> it's, that's not what's going to happen for you. So that the possibility of failure is there, but but you, you know, my conclusion is that if you are, if you are facing it straight on, that that is, in fact, a very real possibility, but you're going to go and do it anyway, um, I think you're better off than if you think, oh, I can do this. Right, I got this. So yeah, right. I got yeah. this thing here. Yeah, totally. You can yeah. shed your hubris, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, so, you know, to me, reading your book, your decision to structure the book in this way, with this tripartite structure, and constructing this, you know, portrait of this man around him through kind of like these three women's uh, lenses it feels very deliberate and intentional. Yeah, I've read some murmurs of criticisms that, you know, um, he's too opaque, you know, at the end of the book that, you know, he just kind of remains a sort of cipher. What is your response to that kind of criticism? Hmm. Uh, I would say reread the book. <laughs> <laughs> That um, my my project, right? My my desire when I started this novel was was to was simply one to acknowledge that Hearn. There's a lot of Hearn out there. Hearn had a lot to say, and and which is wonderful. You know, some of it is wonderful, and some of it really isn't. You know, um, but. My project is not to, to create more hernias, <laughs> you know? <laughs> 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 My project is to, 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 
my project yeah. is is <laughs> <laughs> is is really to to invite other people in, you know, other people who were there in, and and to um, allow us to imagine him not as the great man of letter, you know, right. that he's known for as this sort of iconic, you know, uh, literary figure who introduced uh, Japan to the West, you know, which is bull. Um, yeah, disgusting, totally. <laughs> <laughs> but really to, to what I hope is that when people, you know, close the book, what they see of him is that he was a man. He was a man and he had flaws and he had weaknesses and he had strengths, you know? And one of his strengths, I'll tell you, which I did not really kind of understand in terms of his literary uh, legacy when I first started, was that he was an excellent listener. He was a man who did not dismiss stories just because they came from women or they were told by women, or they were told to children. Think about all the things, you know, ghost stories, folklores, fairy tales, right? These are the stories of the common man, the common people, the common women. And he didn't dismiss that, you know? He said that there's something here, you know, worth documenting, right? So he was a good listener. And then he wrote, right? But to be a good listener, you have to have someone tell you things, right? Totally. You need to have a storyteller, and that's what Alethea was. That's what Setsu was, you know? And so I invited them in, and it seemed right to me that instead of constructing a narrative where there's only one voice, the voice of Hearn, for example, you have the multiple voices, the, the voice it's a chorus, right? Because to me, that's what's wrong, but that's what's lacking in history, which is it's always the one story. And it's usually a partial story, a missing story, you know? And so this is, that was my project, you know, to, to say there are more voices totally. out there. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting that uh, Hearn was a man who was attracted to so many people who kind of existed within the margins and the peripheries. Why, yeah. why do you think that is, you know, after yeah. spending some time with his story like that? Right. Well, at first I thought he was, you know, simply creepy. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, and I think that that's how his um, early biographers kind of, you know, also kind of talked about him, sort of almost like uh, they would talk around the subject. But for sure, I think, you know, Beeslin kind of assumed that, and wrote that um, the reason why Hearn felt so at home among African Americans is because he didn't feel intellectually challenged by them, right? And she completely left out Alethea, to, you know, totally left her out. Um, and you'll, you'll see that in the excerpts that I chose for the novel. Um, and sort of the, the same assumption with why he was attracted to Setsu and the Japanese. That again, somehow he was, you know, above them. And so, and so it was not challenging to him, and so he felt more comfortable in terms of his, his domestic, his, his romantic life, right. do you know? And I think that that actually is only, uh, that may have been indeed true. And the, but for me, what I came away with was that the operative word for Hearn, and I think for really for all of us, is not but or or, it's and. You know, he was that, he's creepy, <laughs> and he also felt him, that he himself was at the margin, that he, 
you know, that his mother, being an Ionian islander, he considered her oriental, you know. Um, right? Yes. I was like, what? Interesting. Really? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and, you know, and there's, there's definitely a lot of discussion where um, the biographers or his contemporary would talk about how his skin was swarthy. Right. Right? Olive complexion. Yes. yes. But let's let's be honest. That's not the same as saying that he's African American. You know, he he could still cross these boundaries, these race boundaries. You know, when he wanted to, and because of his education too. Olive complexion means you're from the Mediterranean. You're from you know a, a certain part of Europe. It does not mean, you know, <laughs> the global south. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Of course. So, um, so, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> Why was he so attracted to people on right, the margins? Right, right, right. So, yes, he, I really do feel that his, he felt himself to be within this, the margins of society. And, and, and whether he truly was, or whether he, you know, he truly appreciated that he had uh, privileges that his his let's say his first wife Alethea certainly could not enjoy, even though she was a biracial woman who, um, you know, he wrote could have passed, you know, except for the the texture of her hair, right? Um, uh, so, yeah, there we find, I think, really the takeaway for me was that, you know, he found his, he was, he was always in this perpetual state of feeling homeless, you know, because of his early childhood without a mother and a father. And, and that really stayed with him, the sense of not belonging somewhere. And maybe in these folks, he he felt a kind of you know kinship. And I'm, I'm trying to think. It was a piece you wrote, Mayuk, about. Oh my. Aha! <laughs> How does it feel? <laughs> no. <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't do this. Yeah. I I think yes. It was the piece about Princess Pamela. Oh yes. Right. Um, and uh, you can fill them in about Princess Pamela, but um, she, I, I'll tell you that she was a, a restaurateur in New York, soul food in the 60s, yeah. right? And Mayuk wrote this incredible, beautiful piece trying to find out what happened to her. And one of the, the thing that stayed with me was when uh, Princess Pamela <laughs> talked about how she found a kinship with the Jewish and the Italian like um, folks in her neighborhood. And she said, it's a kinship, or it, maybe she didn't use that exact word, that comes from like multiple pains. Yeah. or Knowing hurt, yeah. Knowing yeah. hurt. Yes. Right. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that that, so, you know, that to me also explains Hearn's um, gravitating to the margins. Absolutely. I'm curious, um, what is it about these women and their stories that you identified with as a writer? Yeah. Um, well, with, because there are three different women, three different reasons, right? Yeah. yeah, I think for for Rosa, what attracted me to her and her voice was that the way that she was written about by the biographers, they said that she was petulant and childish, and and they talked about how she was illiterate, um, and it took many more sort of uh, iterations of the biography of her for it to finally be revealed that she was actually um, she could speak Romaic and she could speak Venetian, um, and she you know and she was raised in a very sort of literally cloistered way where she had access to the church and basically that was it. Um, and, you know, so 
her her life when she met her oh i i remember exactly now which is i remember reading the age that she was when she met her and she was in her like 25 or like 26 or something like that and that was old right that was old maid land right and I, I, that's where it began, because I thought, why was she still unmarried, you know? And that's always the story. That begins that story for me. Why was she still unmarried, you know? Um, and with Alethea, Alethea, gosh, oh, she, I found this, this interview with um, Alethea in the Cincinnati, I think it was the Cincinnati Inquirer, dated 1906. And she's talking about her relationship with Hearn, and he's passed, he died in 1904. And the reason why this interview exists is because Alethea had filed um, a petition in the probate court in Cincinnati to declare that she was married to Hearn because the, the, the marriage license had burned in a, um, in a fire. Um, not her, not a fire in her own home, but it was a courthouse fire. So uh, a lot of people's uh, documents were lost. But the reason why she wanted to do that was she's basically asserting her right to his estate. And this is, an African-American woman in 1906 going to the courts and saying, this is my right. You know, the moment I read that, I said, I want to spend time with this woman. I want to figure out what gave her all of that strength, you know, and drive. Um, and then she just like, it, it opened up her story because when you I mean for me then when you find out that she was a cook I was like okay <laughs> she was they met because she was the cook in the boarding house where Hearn uh, roomed when he first lived in Cincinnati right and and so that that just that was uh, I felt like I knew her then like, I felt like there was a way for me to really sort of understand her. Did she convince the court that she had a <sighs> Should we read that? Um, the question is, did Alethea convince the courts? And I, I kind of don't want to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's not in the book either, so I, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> because it's actually incredibly poignant. No, she does not. Because basically she, she filed you know, this petition. It was going to be, I'm, I'm sorry, I was a lawyer, so this is going to get legalese. But um, she, if they were going to have an ex parte um, hearing, which means a hearing where the other side didn't have to be present, right? And, and then the judge in charge was like, nope, nope, we got to get the Hearn estate involved. Hearn estate hires, you know, uh, a very good lawyer. They come in. <laughs> they didn't really need a very good lawyer because the only thing they had to say was that that marriage was null and void from the very beginning. Anti-miscegenation -mis laws were in place when they married, right? So that was it. It was over, you know. But uh, let me just say that I insist on saying Alethea was the first wife because it does not matter <laughs> whether it was legal under the eyes of the law. We know many of our relationships were not considered legal under the eyes of the law. And what matters to me was that Hearn considered Alethea and Alethea considered Hearn to be husband and wife. Yeah. So uh, we got to pivot to audience questions in a second, but okay. I have one more question. Uh, so you spend so much time with these women and their stories, and you know them as characters. How difficult is it for you to kind of part ways with them once the process is over, you know, and you finish writing the book? Right. 
Um, uh, I, I actually am very much at peace with their voices, you know? Um, and do I feel like I'm parting ways with them? No, because I'll be reading from them over and over again, hopefully, <laughs> uh -huh. to audiences, just like you. <laughs> but um, I think, I, I mean, I, I know that just as your question, which is sort of that emotional attachment that you can make, sure. right, with the subjects exactly. of, of, your, uh, of your books. Um, yeah, but I, I think... My, my response is still that I feel very at peace with them because I, I, I really gave them all that I had, you know, in terms of my ability to research, my ability to uh, empathize, my ability to, to simply um, sometimes, you know, just just um, feeling lost with them until I actually found, found them again, you know? And that's, I think that's also part of the reason why it took so long. Because um, one of my favorite writers is uh, named Margaret Usenar, and she's a Belgian writer. And she wrote a, an incredible, incredible book in the first person called Memoirs of Adrian, Hadrian. And one of the things that she says about that book is that uh, some narratives, some books, you, you kind of have to be old enough to write them, you know? And so I, I forgive myself the eight years. I had to get, you know, old enough to write them. Okay, I think that's a good note to end on. Uh, so let's turn to audience questions. We do have microphones, by the way, so. Geez, not all at once, OK. <laughs> Can you speak a little bit about the stamina that it took to go through eight years? What happened in year four if you were tired or any of those kinds of moments? <laughs> Mayuk and I were talking a little bit about this, and I, and I said, if you ask a question like that, I'm going to tell you a, a lot about napping. <laughs> um, but in, in all seriousness, I started this in, right, in 2010, 2011, right, Damien? He doesn't know. He's lost his memory <laughs> since then. That's my husband. <laughs> um, but... I, the world changed, right? From the when I started this novel till when it came out just a week or so ago, the world changed, and um, and by that I mean, you know, our new our administration, and it actually it helped very much to to put a lot of rage and fire into this novel um, and it, it gave me a lot of the strength that I needed towards the end because the project uh, of writing and inviting these women to, to, to talk about and to, to narrate this great man became even more necessary, it felt to me. Um, and yeah. yeah. One more. David Ang. Thank you. That was such a great conversation. Thank you so much. And the book is amazing. Um, coming off this question right now, um, when you were talking about Hearn, I had one of the immediate thoughts I had was he's not just an immigrant. He immigrated multiple times. Yes, that's right. Um, and you talked a lot about your identifications with the three women, but I'm wondering if you had an identification with Hearn 
as an immigrant, and even more generally, how do you think about the immigrant story yeah. that actually connects him to you? Right. Oh, David Eng. <laughs> <laughs> You're so brilliant. Um, yes. Certainly, when I first encountered Hearn, the immediate attraction was to me encountering someone who had made the reverse journey that I did, right? That he went from west to east, and he did it willingly, something that I did not do. I did not do it willingly, and I'm always fascinated by people who choose to displace themselves and to put themselves in an environment where they are the other. But I, I pretty much sense that Hearn did not feel like the other <laughs> in Japan. He felt very much that he had become a Japanese, right? And that also then started, you know, my radar. <laughs> And to, to think about uh, sort of sort of the kind of uh, migration and immigration and and that is sort of uh, celebrated and and sanctioned and and um, seen as uh, so, something as a as a conduit to knowledge and narrative as opposed to the kind of migration and immigration that I know, that I was part of, where it was seen as, you know, the bringing with us perhaps, you know, the unassimilable, the, the, the forever foreign, you know. Um, and so for me, you know, Hearn was in a way, you know, the, the, the other side of the mirror. But I wanted to explore that, how whether he was indeed, you know, uh, someone who was able to, to become more Japanese than the Japanese, as he often likes to say about himself. <laughs> And as I read uh, Setsu's memoir, there were so many clues in there where, no, you were not <laughs> Bacario. <laughs> and yet, you know, it, but he's a human, right? He's, 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 he has to convince himself of certain things. And that's part of, then becomes the complexity of that story and how she has to basically continue the fiction for him, and how much anger that must have caused her, how much tension, and yet she held all that in until the man is dead. <laughs> and she's telling that scribe what she knew and what she remembered, you know, and that's what is in The Sweetest Fruits. We're going to take two more questions. Mooney. Um, all of your books are entitled With Elements of Taste. And I wanted to um, see if you can extrapolate on why you chose sweetness for this book. Mm. Yes, I did. <laughs> um, well, I, there are actually um, two responses, right? So the first response is that I actually was looking through that, that Southern Encyclopedia because I was fact checking um, a very particular thing, which was whether there was sugar in cornbread, cornbread recipes in the North or in the South, traditionally speaking, right? Because I had written one thing in, in, you know, just like one sentence in bitter in the mouth, but you know if I got it wrong. <laughs> So in that way, sugar, you know, was there from the very beginning, you know, sugar and sweetness. But I think, um, I, and the sweetest fruits, um, that 
that combination of words comes up uh, in each of the sections, but in different ways. Um, and I'm not going to tell you because I would like you to read the book, but <laughs> but the for um, for for Rosa, the sweetest fruits are the fruits, the figs at the very top of a tall fig tree, the ones that she can't get to, the ones that the birds who fly into this courtyard, that she is in her home and is the only, she's sequestered there basically, they get that fruit and they fly away, you know, so it's something out of reach, right? And then, um, but I think that, that the notion of sweetness is so double-edged for me. And this, and I'll, I'll tell you, if you don't know me very well, then I have diabetes. So s the fact that I called this the sweetest fruits, <laughs> it doesn't really mean what you think it means, you know? <laughs> So, um, so there's always there's always been that double edge, you know, quality to the word sweet for me, and especially the way that it's used to describe women, right, uh, is a way to diminish us. I want to reclaim it. Yeah. One more question. Hi. Hello. <laughs> was there something you had to leave out that you were sad to leave out? Oh, was there something I was sad to leave out? Um, hmm. Yes. <laughs> so many things. Um, one is that one of the things that gets repeated often about uh, Rosa is that she um, towards the end of her life um, entered, was, was placed in um, a mental institution, and that's where she died, right? This was by her second husband. And I, for me, that factoid, I think, is, <laughs> is sort of brought forth by biographers to sort of to cement or to, to to really sort of shore up their argument that she was unstable to begin with, you know, that there was something very profoundly wrong with her from day one. Well, I wish that I had been able to somehow sort of have a, to incorporate that into the novel to really kind of explore the reasons why women <laughs> um, during her time entered into um, a mental asylum, right? And it wasn't often because they were mentally ill. It was because they were inconvenient. It was because they were outspoken. It was because there was another, you know, wife who was waiting, um, you know, to join that family. There are so many reasons. And the fact that they, that biographers use that fact to diminish her just, just irritates me beyond belief, and I'm so sorry I couldn't include it. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's give him a big hand. Thank you. Thank you.